Hey, what's up everyone? I'm Rex Meyer of Beth Area LA, and I want to thank you for checking out this video. In this video, you'll learn all about who the servant of the Lord is and who he is not. But what he's telling us is, look, behold God, behold Elohim, behold El. But now in chapter 42, he says, behold my servant. Not just any servant. This is the nature of, of this servant. He is my servant. This is a unique servant. This is not Israel. This is someone distinct from Israel. Israel has the servant. Keep your finger in Isaiah 42. Look at Isaiah 41. In Isaiah chapter 41, looking at verse 8. I'm going to say verse 8. Yes, verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant. Yes, Isaiah does use the word servant to refer to Israel. He just did. Isaiah 41, verse 8. But if Israel is the servant, why in chapter 42 does he introduce him with, Behold, my servant. He already introduced him to me already. It doesn't make any sense. Why all of a sudden now? He just told me, my servant Israel, Jacob whom I love, or whatever he goes on to say. And now the next chapter, Behold, my servant. Well, because the servant in Isaiah 52 is from Israel. He's a part of Israel. He's the true Israel. He's the most significant of Israel. But he is distinct from Israel. And so here in chapter 42, this is a behold Israel, which gets a behold God. So this Israel, or I should say this servant, Isaiah 42, is a unique servant. He stands apart from all other servants. He's a servant that we are to behold, take note of, supernaturally presented to us. This one is exceptionally significant. Why is he exceptionally significant? Because he's my servant. He's one particularly sent by me. He's one set apart by me. Well, he says, that, look at this, whom I uphold my chosen. He's one set apart. Not only is he chosen in that respect, but we're told that he, was, he is chosen in righteousness. Twice he is spoken of as one that is chosen by God. Not only is he chosen, we're talking about his nature, his status. He's the servant of God in a unique way because he gets a behold like God gets a behold. He's not only a servant in a unique way, he's one who is uniquely chosen by God for the task that he has. No one can do this task but my servant. This is a unique task. This isn't a task like all the other prophets. I may have an Isaiah, I may have a Jeremiah, I may have a Daniel, an Ezekiel, an Elijah, or any of these other prophets. But for what I need this in this instance, I need a my servant who stands apart from all other servants. And so he goes on to say, this is the one in whom my soul delights. You know, this Hebrew expression, the one in whom my soul delights, this is what is said in the Brit Hadashah. You remember it on two occasions, at least three. You remember when Yeshua was immersed? A voice says from heaven, this is my beloved son, what? In whom I am well pleased. That's what Isaiah is saying, in whom my soul takes delight. Why does God take his delight in this one? Because this is the one who is my servant whom you are to behold, because what he's going to do is bring Jacob back to me. He's the one who's going to bring salvation where it is needed. No other one can do this. And so he goes on to say, not only is he the one in whom my soul delights. You remember on the Mount of the Transfiguration? Yeshua is transfigured in all of his glory. Peter, James, and John are in front of him, and a cloud overshadows him. And the Lord says, this is my what? Beloved son, the son in whose soul I find and take delight. And so that's what the revelation in the book of Matthew or uh, in Matthew 16 and Matthew 4 are telling us, he are building on is what Isaiah says here. So not only is he my servant that you are to behold, not only is, is he the one who I have chosen, not only is he the one in whom I take delight in and find pleasure in, he's the one I uphold. He's the one that I proclaim. He's the one that I draw everyone's attention to. And he's the one that I in, encourage, is not quite the right word, but stabilize. He's the one that I hold up because the task that he has is great. This is not a normal task that we're going to be talking about. This is a task that will take the supernatural empowerment and stability of God himself. In fact, he goes on to say, look at verse 1. We haven't gotten very far, but we're coming to an end here. But look at verse 4. He says, I'm the one I have put my spirit upon him. Now, you know what's really neat about that? The wor little word, little word, upon. 
It's talking about the Spirit of God. But you know, in the book of Isaiah, every time the Spirit of God is related to the Messiah, it's always upon him. You might have expected it to say, I will put my spirit in him. I will give my spirit to him. But no, 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 no. What's here is that my spirit will be upon him. Let me show you something. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. I mean, Isaiah is just so consistent and so clear as to what he's saying. Every Shabbat, we draw attention. We, draw, we write, light these candles. And while we may go through this rather quickly, it's really very significant symbolism for us. Because it symbolizes what Isaiah is saying here. Isaiah 42, I have put my spirit upon him. But this comes out of what Isaiah said earlier in chapter 11. In chapter 11, he tells us that this one, the Messiah, the branch of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, here it is again, will rest upon him. In Isaiah 42, I will put my spirit upon him. In Isaiah chapter 11, I have placed my spirit upon him. Again, not in, with, to, it's upon. And then look what else he goes on to say. The, he, the Hebrew is very clear. It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And look at verse two, 3. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now we know why, Isaiah 42, the Lord says, my soul finds delight in him. Because he finds delight in the Lord. He de finds delight in reverencing God and fearing him. So when one finds delight in the Lord, he then in return finds delight in us. That's why we need to know him. That's why Paul's most important phrase, little phrase, being in Messiah. What does it mean to be in Messiah? It means to be identified with Messiah. And when we're identified with Messiah, we, like Messiah, are taking delight in the Lord. And when we take delight in the Lord, he takes delight in us. He looks upon us with his blessings and not his judgment. He looks upon us as his children and not as some other ones. In one sense, all human beings are children of God as creations of God. But on another sense, not everyone who's a children of God is a child of God. We're children of God by virtue of being given authority to become children of God, John tells us in John chapter 1. We're given authority, we're given the right to become children of God because we've recognized the Messiah of Israel. It's a right that's given to us by his grace, not one that's earned or deserved. But when we are in Messiah, we're taking delight in the Father. When we take delight in the Father, he takes delight in us. And when he takes delight in us, his blessings are given to us in great magnitude. So in Isaiah chapter 11, the spirit of the Lord is upon him. And so what these candles symbolize is the spirit of wisdom and counsel and might and of fear of the Lord and the rest of them. But it's saying the sevenfold fullness of the Spirit rests upon our Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, it says, My servant whom I delight, I have put my Spirit upon him. Why can he do these things that he does? Is because he does them in the power and means of the Spirit of God. He's relying upon the Spirit of God to enable him to accomplish the things that he would do while he's in the flesh. And so the fullness of the Spirit of God empowers him, rests upon him, energizes him, guides him, and directs him. And as such, he lives a perfect, sinless life and bears all of our sin and does that which is most difficult for the Lord needs to uphold him. Isn't that what he said, Isaiah 42, verse 1? Whom I uphold, who I have to enable, who I have to help, because it is so massive uh, a... Uh, a purpose that he has. And what's his purpose? He's going to take all the sin of all of humanity from all the time upon himself. He's going to suffer and die for our sin in our place. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane he says, if it is possible, may this cup pass from me. But the Lord upholds him and he says, not my will, but thy will be done. This was not an easy task. We go through it very simply. We say, Lord, Thank you for taking upon me my sin. Come into my life. And we're saved. If we really mean that. 
And then in the morning, we just celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do it very easily. We take the bread, we take the wine, we drink it, we say the prayer. We think deeply for sure. But what Messiah did is of a massive consequence that we cannot fathom ever. It will take all of eternity to, to even begin to scratch the surface of what he did in our, in our play. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure you subscribe. Leave a comment and share with your friends. Shalom. I'm Rabbi Gary of Beth Ariel LA and I want to invite you to our High Holy Day services. If you go to highholydaysinla.com, you'll get all the information that you need. And if you let us know that you're coming, we'll send you our devotional series in preparation for the High Holy Days. So go to highholydaysinla.com and we'll see you at Beth Ariel for the High Holy Days. Shalom.